So back to soot. Um, so here's the, uh, you, you, saw, you saw the like, size distributions um, before for premix flame, ethylene um, as a fuel um, at different heights of the flame. The right hand side is the extinction spectrum. Um, I think for this one they, I don't know if they extracted the soot and then measured the extinction on uh, this group, some of them uh, extracted and, and some of them are um, in the flame itself, extinction in the flame. There are some issues with doing extinction in the flame itself, but just, you know, this is, let, let's say this is the spectrum of the soot it's, um, from the flame. Uh, as you go up in the flame, notice that the spectrum changes. So low in the flame, you're gonna have stronger absorption at shorter wavelengths. And then as you go up in the flame, um, your spectrum gets broader, right, as the soot matures. So this is you know, basically absorbance or absorption cross-section. Um, and you know that, notice that it gets flatter, that whole distribution gets flatter. Um, this is, um, leads to um, what we call these numbers, um, we, in, in the combustion community, we call it the dispersion exponent. In the atmospheric community, they call it the angstrom exponent. It's the same thing. Um, and it relates to this parameter that, so the absorption cross, so this equation up at the top is the absorption cross section. Um, and it's related to some constants times the, di the diameter of the particle cubed. Um, for this, for Rayleigh particles, so you have long, pretty long wavelengths. So Ray, um, the diameter of the particle cubed um, over six times the um, wavelength of light to this parameter. So they call it N in the figure, and I tend to make it that C. Um, uh, that's the dispersion exponent. So you can see it's wavelength to the N. So that is going to tell you something about how broad this, the um, absorption is. Um, so when soot is actually pretty mature, like when it's almost fully mature, it has an angstrom exponent or a dispersion exponent close to one. It's almost always very close to one. Um, I've measured it less than one, and other people have measured it less than one when you get it really, like in the most mature, you in, in a flame, on the very edge of a flame, of a diffusion flame, you can see that it's less than one, but it's, you can generally think of, in your head, if, you're, if someone asks you what the dispersion exponent is for mature, just say one. So um, as you get less mature, that angstrom exponent gets larger. And this can tell you something about how mature the particles are. So if you're gonna make a measurement, you can make a measurement in a flame if you can measure that dispersion exponent, you have a, a, a measure of how mature the soot is. So let's call it kind of a maturity type parameter. Um, and I think this is, this is a good parameter to keep in mind. The atmospheric scientists use this parameter to also tell them about whether or not, they, they mostly use it to say whether or not if they're measuring particles in the atmosphere, they've come from smoldering combustion or flaming combustion. So when they see something that's close to one, they go, oh, okay, we have flaming combustion, which means that you actually have a big flame and the particles are going out through the flame front, They're, they've gotten hot and, and they've matured. Um, when you have smoldering combustion, you actually don't really have um, a flame. It's, you can have flameless combustion and it's, it's the reactions that are happening on the surface. So this, you'll, you'll see, um, um, like peat bogs will often have smoldering combustion. Um, and there are different conditions, like, you know, when you don't have the hot fire going yet and you just have oxidation go on the surface of the biomass, you get smoldering combustion. And, you, and, and people measure, you know, these angstrom exponents of three, four, five under those conditions. So, um, so for us, it's actually a good measure. If we want to measure inside a combustor and we have a way of doing it, um, then we can just make that measurement and have some idea of what's happening inside the combustor. Okay. Um, people off, also often talk about this uh, op, optical band gap. This is another um, measurement. 
Um, they usually drive it from these, these spectra, and um, it tells them um, basically what kind of absorption they can get from a particular material. So, um, but you'll notice, what I wanted to point out is the um, optical band gap also gets larger as the dispersion exponent gets larger. Okay, and, and people back out from this optical band gap, they back out how big the, the, you know, the sheets of graphene are, that are stacked on top of each other. Okay, so increasing maturity increases what we call the long range order, um, and that, um, and we call that also a conjugation length, so I'll use that term a little bit later, um, uh, and it, it also increases the stacking, so we have stacking in the particle. Okay. Okay, so when we have um, an incipient particle, um, again, let's go back and look at some of the data. Here are some more data for TEM, like spherical particles. Um, this is um, this is Hai Wang's group. Um, they they appear uh, spherical and kind of like mushy. Um, they look like they spread. Like so, here it looks like it spreads a little bit on the. Uh, upper left-hand TEM image, and there's the corresponding AFM image. They also did this experiment. There's the AFM image that makes the particle look like it spreads out. So the, the bottom right-hand one is what I showed you uh, earlier. Um, uh, and, and, and so people just basically see all of this, see very similar results. But it's really, really, really hard to make these measurements. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about why it's hard to make the measurements um, and um, what happens when you try to extract something from a flame, when you stick a probe into the flame. Oh, that's for me? Yeah. Oh, thank Sorry you. Thank you. Do you want to go? Do you, do you want to have a cup of coffee? Like, did, did everyone, yeah? Yeah. Um, is it okay if we take another short break, Ed? So people can have some coffee? Oh, do we have another, when is it coming up? Okay, okay, we'll wait, okay, okay. Okay, so, okay. I'll try to, I'll try to keep you awake. Um, so we have, so now we have, um, the particles are spherical, waxy, right? Um, they absorb in the UV, kind of weakly at longer wavelengths. Um, they photoionize at, whatever, we don't know, 6.3 EV, about, um, and they have disordered fine structure. Okay, so um, what about their composition? How do we know anything about what's in them, right? We know kind of like what's in the gas phase, and we know kind of like what they end up looking like when we look at high-res TEM. What, how, what is actually in those particles? Okay, so we have this um, scanning mobility particle size again um, for this experiment I'm gonna show you. This is actually a really beautiful experiment. Um, and you see that we have our few nanometer sized particles. Um, this is also atomic force microscopy. It's high resolution atomic force microscopy. This is, I, I just love this experiment. They also did TEM. It's on the bottom uh, right, along with those, th those ones that are next to it that look, look like they're plastic. Those are calculations. Okay, so there's a, the, um, density functional um, calculations on the, to match the um, TEM images on the, on the lower right. But, or no, STM, sorry, STM um, images on the right. So, but on the left-hand side, and then the top four squares on the right, um, those are atomic force microscopy. So this is high res. So what they did is they, they um, extracted from a flame, and then they, so they had these things on it. They actually stuck a grid into a flame and pulled it out. Um, they put that under vacuum. And then they put another grid under vacuum. And they, and they cooled the second grid down um, and heated the first grid up. So they vaporized some of the stuff that was on the first grid onto the second grid. And that's, which was this, and the, the reason they did this, they, they wanted a really clean surface to do this. So they did this under high vacuum, put it in front of their AFM machine under high vacuum, and then did high resolution so they could actually see atoms. So this was a really beautiful experiment. So you can see when they did that, you can see the structure of some of the species they saw from the particles when they grabbed them in the flame. 
And this is really nice. Like you can make out the six-membered rings. You can make out five-membered rings. I'll show you in a little bit. I'll show you other ones that where they saw like, like you know, um, aliphatic side chains, like chains of carbon atoms coming off of them. Um, they saw bridges. So there's M8. The one in the middle is a bridge between two um, um, benzene-like structures, right? They saw really interesting structures. The bottom one on the left is a bridge between two larger pHs. Um, so this was actually fascinating. This is um, kind of backs up some of the stuff that people were doing right before they did this. They're like, oh, I mean, it seems like there should be five-membered rings should be important. You know, radicals should be important. You know, so. So this experiment was kind of like helped crystallize some of that work. OK. Um, yeah, so I've added below each of those um, species their carbon to hydrogen ratio. OK, so remember, when people extract, extract out of the flame and they do the elemental analysis on these particles, they see a carbon-hydrogen ratio of like 1.3 to 2, somewhere in that range, right? So they already knew kind of like from that bulk measurement the carbon-hydrogen ratio. So here are some of the carbon-hydrogen ratios of species that were just, you know, observed, imaged in that experiment. And they're kind of right in that right range. So it, it kind of does look like maybe they are part of the particles, right? OK. Um, they did another experiment that, um, this is all in the same paper. They did another experiment where they used Raman spectroscopy to look at the material so they could actually see um, the Raman spectrum of the material itself. OK, Raman spectra. Um, when you take a Raman spectrum of graphite, single crystal graphite, what you see is the peak on the right, I don't know if you can see where, the one that says the arrow has sp2 carbon, that's called the G peak. So you can remember that as, that's the graphite peak. And when you see single crystal graphite, it will be a sharp peak. Um, and, and the one on the left is associated with defects. So this is just, tell, this is basically telling you we do not have pure graphite, but we have something that's like, like kind of like graphite. From, from that, from the um, Raman spectrum, you can actually get, see that um, LA equals that D, ID, of, so the intensity of the D peak, which is the left-hand peak, over the intensity of the G peak, the right-hand peak, um, gives you LA. That's the conjugation length. That's how big these sheets are in that. Um, that's a measure of how big the, on average, the sheets are inside that um, particle, OK? And that's close to 1.1 nanometers. Many, many, many experiments have demonstrated that for the not, not incipient particles, actually, for the particles that are at least partially mature, matured is on the order of one, one nanometer or so. The bottom um, number, um, so the MPL, that's the slope of the photoluminescence background. So you see where I've drawn a little arrow that says slope. Um, the slope of that luminescence background divided by the intensity of the G peak gives you a measure of the carbon to hydrogen ratio, um, and that's 2.3. So that also indicates if our incipient particles are 1 point carbon to hydrogen, 1.3 to 1 point or 2, um, that kind of indicates that you have kind of a maturing particle. And then the size, the conjugation length together indicates you have what we would call partially mature or young particle. OK, not fully mature, like not even all that mature, but probably not completely incipient. So this is a particle that's kind of like, you know, just starting to like grow its little um, PAHs that are probably part of the particle. OK, so this is kind of evidence, like what's happening to, to form these particles. OK. Um, and this is demonstrate some significant abundance of aliphatic groups. So I'm going to talk about this. So remember, when we think about soot, when we think about soot, we're thinking about pHs coming together. It's not necessarily pHs coming together. OK. So here's another from the same group, um, just a different paper. Um, so 
this, um, I usually think of car, I do carbon over hydrogen because it's, I find it easier to remember numbers that are over one um, instead of fractions. Um, but a lot of people do H over C. Um, there are some reasons to do use H over C um, if you're doing a calculation, but um, C over H is, it's easier. So on the right-hand side, I put C over H for, for you, for me, actually for me too. Um, so you see that the number, of, so they took their data and they, they said, okay, let's count the number of carbons and then calculate our, our ratio of H over C, C over H. Um, and they did two different experiments, one low in the flame and one high in the flame, or you know, two different heights. I'm not sure eight millimeters is low. It seems kind of high to me. It seems like you probably have some maturity there. But, um, but they did that and they, they said, okay, that's, we see this curve and as we get larger number of carbons, we have basically a higher carbon to hydrogen ratio. Does that make sense to you? How would you think that that would be? Here. If you're thinking about these, these um, molecules growing, how would you think that carbon would be increasing relative to hydrogen? Or who said that? Elimination. And how would you eliminate? Uh-huh. And what would be happening to what the particle looks like? Yes. And no, more number of rings, right? What's your name? John. John. Excellent. Yes. Um, so yes, you're, you're growing more rings, right? So as you grow more, if you think about it, oh, I probably, oh, yeah, I think I, I, I did this out. OK, here's naphthalene, right? So that naphthalene is C10H8, carbon to hydrogen ratio of 1.25. Okay, here's anthracene. I have add an extra ring, right? Um, C14H10, higher carbon to hydrogen ratio, right? As you go up, as you add rings, you're basically taking away hydrogens and adding carbons with, with not as many hydrogens, right? The rings are, are your taking spots to, that had hydrogen on them, okay. Um, okay, does everyone see why those are C, like where the hydrogens are? No, yes, no. So the hydrogens, okay, yeah. The hydrogens are implied. So when you have something that looks like this, um, remember each carbon has to have three bonds, right? So this is, there has to be a hydrogen here because as one, two, this is a double bond. So this carbon has two bonds to that carbon, one bond to that carbon, and one bond to the hydrogen, so it has four bonds. Each carbon has to have four bonds. So these are, so when you see structures like that drawn out, um, those, those are implied hydrogens. As, as Mani Sarathi said this morning, I don't bother to draw those hydrogens. Um, they're there, okay? So, so those are, so each time you're adding a ring, you're taking away some hydrogens, but adding more carbons with, the, with fewer hydrogens, okay? So that's what's happening, you're growing. That, in your head, you should be thinking, okay, that makes sense. As I grow these, these structures, that's the way I do this. Okay, this is the way we normally think about this stuff. So that all makes sense. But when they did this, these calculations, they didn't, they actually said, we're not gonna take into account the aliphatic side chains. And remember, there are a whole bunch of them in the, the last um, slide, right? There are a lot of aliphatic side chains. So what's, what's gonna happen to that? That curve, right, is gonna go up. Your, your carbon to hydrogen ratio will go down, your hydrogen to carbon ratio will go up. So that curve actually goes up when you take into account the aliphatic side chains. 
Okay, so now we have to start, we have to, like it doesn't make sense not to consider the aliphatic side chains because if you're gonna compare to the measurements where people just do elemental analysis where they just count the number of hydrogens and, and carbons just by like, you know, reacting the hydrogens away and making them water or however they do the measurement, carbons away and making CO2, measuring the CO2, um, then you, that's how that measurement, they don't care if it's an aliphatic side chain or uh, an aromatic ring, right? So you have to, if you're gonna compare to data, you wanna be able to take into account aliphatic side chains. Normally we think that they're not present or important in soap formation, but now let's start to think like, maybe they are present. So here's if you add an aliphatic side chain. So if you added, um, what I'm um, kind of, so here's your, now you've taken, you have to take away that hydrogen, right? You add this side chain. Now um, you have one, two, three, four bonds to that carbon. Um, this one has two hydrogens. Because if that's a single bond and that's a single bond, that has to have two hydrogens, and this is gonna have three. Okay, so you're gonna have a lot of hydrogens, and that's gonna lower your carbon to hydrogen ratio. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so, um, so here's an experiment my group did um, where we did pyrolysis of uh, propene and propyne. And um, we did aerosol mass spec. So we took, we extracted particles from the flame and we vaporized them on a, a target. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about this tomorrow. We vaporized them on a target um, and uh, under vacuum and the particles, the molecules that came off, we ionized those, and then we did mass spec, okay? So um, what we saw, um, and this was uh, for, um, if, if we pyrolyzed the two separate experiments, pyrolyzed propine and propene, um, and the different colors are different temperatures. So the lowest temperature is, um, uh, so I'll say squares and circles in case you're colorblind, the lower lines are the lower, lowest temperatures. And notice that how low the carbon-hydrogen ratio is, even for the large molecules, right? So now you must be thinking, hmm, that must be something like aliphatic side chains, right? Or aliphatic species. Like, how are you going to get that high, that low a carbon-to-hydrogen ratio with that many carbons? with these pretty large hydrocarbon species. They have to have some, some kind of interesting character to them that we don't normally think about. Okay, so, and we see that for both um, propane, propene and propine. Um, so the um, species that are all these six-membered rings um, lumped, you know, put together, like say, uh, if you know what pyrene is, has four um, aromatic rings together in a lump, we call this peri-condensed hydrocarbons aromatic hydrocarbons. Okay. Um, so uh, on the right-hand side, we see that, like, um, what, so the top figure is the average carbon to hydrogen ratio um, for, um, as a function of temperature for the, the experiment. So this is like, now we're increasing, we're taking our fuel, we're increasing the temperature, um, and then counting all the carbon to hydrogen um, ratios for all the molecules that we see in, in our uh, mass spec. Um, and you see that the um, carbon to hydrogen ratio increases with temperature. Does that make sense? I see some nodding. Why does that make sense? You're nodding. You're getting rid of the hydrogen, yeah, exactly. Right? So what's your name? Tanner. Dan? Tanner. 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 So that's exactly right. You're, you're getting rid of the hydrogens as you go to higher temperature. This is what's going to happen when you have, remember, remember when you're causing the particles to, to mature? And you're, so what's happening in the flame is they're heating up, right? And they're having pretty long residence time at higher temperatures. You're getting rid of those hydrogens when you do that. You, that happens also in pyrolysis. Okay? So... So that's, and we see that actually the most um, important effects are for the larger species. So if we take only carbon number 17 and above, so the right-hand side, and just 
ignore the left two points and just take the right hand points, um, those are the ones that are changing the most as we heat up. The large species are, they're reorganizing and getting rid of hydrogens. So you have these, probably have these aliphatic side chains, they're reacting um, as, they, as they form um, rings and stuff, they're gonna be getting rid of the hydrogens. Okay, however, they ha however that happens, that chemistry magic happens. Okay, um, so yeah, we have a significant abundance of aliphatic um, side chains, and our, our C to H ratio is about 1.4 for all of those experiments. Um, here's another um, experiment that was kind of a shock when it was first done by Hai Wang's group. So um, this is where they took soot out of a flame and did just IR spectroscopy on the soot. And what they saw was like, they saw oxygen embedded in the particles. It looks like oxygen, it was at least on the surface. Um, and you know, the, uh, the left-hand peaks where it says aliphatic um, CH, that was kind of a surprise. Like people were like, whoa, why is there so much aliphatic, you know, that can't be, that can't be, right? We just didn't expect it, right? So this was kind of a shock of an experiment. Um, uh, so here are the size distributions. Um, some of these size distributions um, indicate, as you can see, this is like, the bottom axis, x-axis, is, is particle size, right? The y-axis is the you know, number of particles in that size bin, so these are size distributions. Um, and you can see, these are different flames, like um, they're actually all the same equivalence ratio, but different flow rates in a premix flame. And, and this is a, um, the burner where you have the stabilization plate that goes down and acts as a probe as well. Right? Um, so, uh, but just ignoring what the different flow rates are, um, you see that as you go, the bottom one HP means height of the height of the plate, so base height, height of a burner um, is 0.6, and then you go up to one um, centimeter. Um, as you go up, your size distributions get larger, right? So you're starting to get more mature, right? Your particles are getting bigger; they're growing, um, and. At one of those, I don't know which where that sampling was. It didn't say in the paper, but I just wanted to show you. Um, the, this group um, was seeing that. This is what they kind of like summed up their experiments. So, um, and there is the data are kind of noisy, but still, it's interesting that they see on the left hand side is the aliphatic carbon to hydrogen to the aromatic. Now we would normally think for as you go up in the flame, your aliphatic should be like going to zero, right? That's normally what we, we were thinking all along, but that's not what they were seeing. They were seeing actually a, like a aliphatic to aromatic um, in this experiment of way more than one, like almost like, like at the lowest heights, you know, three? That's, that's really kind of amazing. Um, so this, is, this was kind of, this was just totally unexpected. But now I'm thinking, Maybe that's just like what, you know, this is our new kind of route to figure out what's happening, okay? We need to be doing different types of experiments. Okay, so particles have high aliphatic content and oxygenated species in the particles. We didn't expect that one either, okay? And then a lot of people have seen the oxygenated species using different, uh, um, using IR spectroscopy in particles. Okay, um, in fact, here's an experiment we did we're trying to understand. So here's, here's an example of, of us trying to put together different techniques to understand what's going on. Okay, so we saw, okay, in this ex that experiment, they saw oxygen, right? What the heck, why is there oxygen inside the particles, right? This, it just doesn't, like it seems like it shouldn't be there. Uh, if you go to high temperatures, you, you should have, it seems like it should have oxidation and you emit CO or CO2, right? Um, Okay, so we did this experiment, and we didn't mean to do it. It was just we're taking data, trying to figure out what was in these sensitive particles. And um, this is uh, also a premix flame at different heights. Um, uh, actually, the lowest one is at the top. Sorry, uh, it's opposite. Um, but uh, the red peaks are peaks that we identified, so they're mass peaks that we identified with oxygenated species. Um, the blue peaks are the ones that are pure hydrocarbon, no oxygen. So we actually saw a lot of peaks that looked like they had oxygen in them. 
And we could tell um, by uh, the mass uh, difference, like we could tell by the mass of the oxygen, it was slightly different from a carbon. So oxygen is 16, a carbon is 12. If you have 12 plus four hydrogens, it should be the mass of an oxygen. Um, but we, we had just enough resolution to distinguish those. So we could tell those peaks were oxygenated. Um, and we're trying to understand what was going on. So we uh, collaborated with Angela Violi's group um, to do some modeling. So uh, they, they um, used their kinetic Monte Carlo um, molecular dynamics um, simulations and, and ran some calculations. And they said, oh, OK. Actually, um, what they saw was like, oh, if there's OH in the flame, then you're going to have, you can actually have OH attach to your molecule, right? Um, so it generates um, an O, like a COC. So remember, that's called an ether group, right? Um, so you have, see that aliphatic side chain? See, uh, the, you have the, um, the second one from the left, you have an ether group. And then on a radical, the radical end, and that goes and bonds and makes a ring um, with the, the rest of the molecule, right? This is called a furan. Furans are um, highly toxic. They're one of these pollutants people really worry about. Um, you find them anytime you have, high, like, um, carbonaceous materials that you heat, like in coffee. People find them in baby food. These are species that um, people worry about health. They're very worried about um, furans. In fact, I think coffee, actually one of the uh, flavors you like is a furan. Um, hopefully, hopefully we're not ingesting a lot of it, but, um, but this is something that no one expected to see in a flame, right? From, and this is ethylene. We're just burning ethylene. Like what, like, you know, and this is, furans are actually also proposed as, you know, alternative fuels, like biofuel derived fuels. Um, so this is kind of fascinating that we actually just generated it with ethylene. We, we totally didn't expect it. So we're like, okay, but we have to prove it. We can't just like rest on our laurels and say, we just have a model that shows us. We have to prove that it's, um, that it's probably furan. So we did an experiment where we did, we took these particles and we did x-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. This helps us figure out the binding. We'll talk more about this tomorrow. This is a technique that helps you figure out binding between atoms in a, a sample. Um, and we see lower in the sample, um, if you, so these are three different heights in the burner, and then summarized on the right-hand side, um, where um, the, the peaks, uh, so this peak shifts, so you can, it's the, car, it's the um, oxygen binding energy. So you have CO, um, CO, the ethylene, the ether, COC, and the COH. So low in the flame, you have a high COH peak, right? As you go up and you have a little bit of the ether peak, as you go up in the flame, that CO peak goes away and that the ether peak comes in. The ether peak is for the furan. So it's important, I think, to kind of like, when we think we know something, to try to confirm it. Um, and this is still an experiment we'd like to confirm, but we've, we, when we do this, we totally swamp the, um, the uh, mass spec with water um, because, uh, you know, when you combust stuff, like you generate water and mass specs don't like that very much. And um, we do these experiments at a synchrotron and we've a couple times almost shut down the synchrotron by like having like all of a sudden like the pressure goes up too high and then there's an emergency and it's like, it's really embarrassing. So um, yeah, it's an experiment I'd like to redo up for different conditions and see if we still see it. Um, but right now we actually, uh, dry the, um, our samples to, before we send them into the mass spec. Okay. Okay. So, um, so let's talk more about particle composition. Um, so here are a number of different experiments um, where people have used mass spectrometry, right? So, um, and in this particular type of mass spectrometry, you collect a sample um, and then you vaporize it so you can see the individual molecules um, from that from the sample. Um, so our stuff is on like we have this is a, a premixed um, flame and a counterfill flame with two different fuels, um, and it looks very similar to the one in the middle. Um, 
which is uh, also from Hai Wang's group. Um, you see all these, a lot of the very same peaks. Um, and then on the right-hand side, an older one from uh, Dobbins et al., from their group, um, also showing um, a mass spec. So the one on the right-hand side and the one in the middle, they actually um, vaporized and ionized with the laser. Okay, so they, they took a sample, they stuck a plate into a flame, got a sample, and then stuck it into uh, an instrument where they vaporized and ionized um, the sample, um, and then got the mass spectrum of the gas phase species. And on our side, we actually have, a, we generate a, a focused beam of particles that hits a hot target and vaporized using thermally, not with a laser. But we see the very similar things. And what we see are these peaks. Uh, this is really common. You see these even numbered peaks. And you know they appear to be associated with um, these peri-condensed um, hydrocarbons, peri-condensed polycyclic ar aromatic hydrocarbons. And um, for decades, we've all assumed that these are what these are the stabilomers. So stabilomers are the most thermodynamically stable species at a particular carbon and hydrogen ratio. So, so if um, the way you read this um, table is you say at the top is a list of the number of carbon atoms in the molecule, and on the left is the number of hydrogen atoms in the molecule. And then the species um, are, in, are the ones that are associated with those different hydrocarbons, different carbon to hydrogen ratio, okay? Um, I've actually put uh, along the top the number of six-membered rings that are associated with them, and I've, I've added in red the carbon to hydrogen ratio for each of those species. So as you get to bigger and bigger stabilomers, you get higher and higher carbon to hydrogen ratio, okay? Okay, so um, so this is the stabilomer grid, and we've all we all assumed that what we're seeing in all those mass spectra were the stabilomers. Like each one has a mass peak, and we would expect to see that the most thermodynamically stable species at that mass. So, um, so um, one of the things we did was um, we. When we do our experiment at the synchrotron, we can actually tune the photon energy that we use to ionize the molecule. Okay, so we can you know, tune that, and and you know we can we start at you know a, an ion uh, photon energy where we don't see any signal, and as we go up in photon energy, at some point we're going to start seeing signal, and usually that's associated with the species we're actually looking at. Like, so what we normally, the way we do this though is we don't just sit on a peak and tune. We um, take mass spectra out a whole bunch of energies, photon energies. So we basically have all of the whole range of masses at each energy. And at some energies, you, don't, you see some peaks, but not all of them. And then as you go up, you start to, they start to grow in. And then eventually, if you get to too high energy, you start to fragment. And then you start to see smaller um, species, okay? So that's how we do the experiment. But we can use what we call the photoionization um, cross-section curves spectra, or um, people call it photoionization efficiency. We can use that to help identify isomers um, at a particular mass. So in a mass spectrum, you just see a mass, right? And we can assume that it's this or assume that it's that because we expect it to be there. But it's nice to know exactly what it is, right? So there, here are the... Um, photoionization efficiency or photoionization cross-section curves for um, a number of different polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, right? So those all have different masses, but we went and recorded those. Um, and then a lot of people have recorded them uh, um, for a whole bunch of different species. So this is a really common technique in this, um, doing mass spec at the synchrotron. So here's an example of how you might use them. Um, so we have flame sampled particles, we do take the mass spectrum, we get our peaks, and we get the PIE curves for all the different peaks. Um, you see that um, we sample it here, we have two different heights in the flame, um, and uh, the two different heights in the flame actually look very similar. That indicates that those um, isomers are probably very similar in the two different heights in the flame. 
Like we're not seeing very, di very much difference between the two different heights where we extracted. Um, but you see if we compare them in the top um, panel, we compare them to the PIE curve for pyrene, this is mass 202. This is where, this is what we always assumed was pyrene, and it's not pyrene. So um, it doesn't, pyrene doesn't agree with our peaks, with our, with our curves at that mass. Okay, okay, and this, this was kind of like, um, kind of disturbing in some ways. Like we've always assumed that we have a lot of pyrene. Right, and this is, so if we compare it with fluoranthine, it does, it's not fluoranthine either, that also has a mass 202. If we use a linear combination of pyrene and fluoranthine, we can fit our curves. So we think that it's probably a combination of pyrene and fluoranthine at mass 202. So all this time, you know, everyone's been focusing on pyrene as kind of like the first species. Like if you, if you look at soot models, often their pyrene dimerization is the initial step in soot inception. But if 202 isn't even pyrene, if we're not having a lot of pyrene, it, so what, what the heck's going on, right? Um, okay, so what we did is we then, we, we were like, okay, that's pyrene, but, um, we actually see that um, that peak, that mass is fluoranthine and pyrene. And sometimes we see that it's mostly fluoranthine, that it looks a lot like fluoranthine. Okay, fluoranthine is not the most stable, but it's a fascinating molecule. And this can give us information about what's going on. So this is the first step in realizing, aha, uh -huh, it's not the most, we're not all driven by thermodynamics, right? There's something else going on. Now we have to start thinking kinetics is, is really important in soot formation. Okay, and you're saying, oh, we should have thought of that before. But, you know, it's nice to know, like, okay, we have some evidence that it's not thermodynamics. Okay, here's another one. Here's anthracene. We find that it's, it's actually mostly phenanthrene. Here's another one. We find... I don't know how to say this, acenaphylene, acenaphylene um, is mostly one ethanyl um, naphthalene. Um, all of these ones are not what we expected. I mean, we have, and then coronine, that's another one people actually focus on a lot with respect to nucleation type mechanism for inception. It's not coronine. We don't know what it is, but it's definitely not coronine. Um, and then here's a fascinating one. I added this to the grid. This is a radical um, species. So this, this species is at mass 91. It's C7H7. And um, when we went to measure it, we're like, um, oh, it looks like vinyl cyclopentadienyl. Like, so a pentadienyl has five membered rings plus like a two, two carbons off chain off of um, cyclopen cyclopentadiene. Um, but everyone, what people were like, no, no, you are totally wrong, it is benzyl. Benzyl is the most stable species, it has to be benzyl. So we're like, ah, oh, you know, I don't know, it's, you know, our data are kind of, you know, uncertain, yeah, okay, maybe it's benzyl, maybe it's benzyl. So we ended up doing a study, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in a bit. Um, it turns out it's not, Part of it's benzyl, probably, but but we also have at that mass we also see think we see tropyl and orthotolyl um, and vinyl cyclopentadienyl is almost always there. So that tells you something about what's happening um, in the kinetics. If we're seeing all these different species, there's something really interesting going on. It's not even even in the radicals we're not seeing it sink to the um, most thermodynamically stable. So we're actually skipping over a lot of the most thermodynamically stable species. We're not, we're not falling into the well and staying there. We're doing something that's kind of interesting chemically. Okay, so, so here's our next, like what do we know about inception and Sipia particles. Um, they have aliphatic and oxygenated species, um, species content. Um, the um, the um, masses that we see, we see both in pyrolysis and flames with different 
under different um, conditions with different fuels. We're seeing a lot of the same. Remember I was saying how exciting it is that you know, we have the same type of morphology and fine structure at the end? I mean, now we're seeing a lot of consistency. So it's nice to like try to track that down so we can follow the trail. Okay, um, the precursors are not, apparently not the most thermodynamically stable. Um, and um, they have carbon hydrogen ratios probably close, probably less than 2 point, um, closer to, to 1.3 to 2.0, which is what we were saying earlier. Okay, so, so now let's talk about the radicals. So we had been doing this, um, uh, okay, when we started doing these experiments um, in 2011, we were like, okay, we just want to see these PAHs that are, that are causing nucleation of particles to nucleate. And we couldn't figure out what was nucleating the flame because the species we're seeing were too small to nucleate. So we did these experiments, did them under all these different conditions and different flames and you know, different fuels and we kept seeing the same thing. And we kept seeing this, you know, our, um, our mass distribution I showed you earlier, you, you saw this, like this is what we were seeing in almost every single time, the same peaks, like what, like we're like, ah, oh, how are we gonna figure this out? Um, what are these things? It, they're not, they're not the stabilomers, what, you know, what's going on? So then we started to look at where we, these, these um, odd peaks, odd mass peaks kept popping up and we were like, like those are just a nuisance, like what are they? Um, we see them very strongly in our mass spec because um, I think what happens is we're not really sensitive to the smaller masses because our, um, in order to get masses into our mass spec, they have to go through our sampling line into the vacuum chamber through an aerodynamic lens system which focuses the particles into a beam. Then they hit the, um, the plate, um, our heated plate, and are vaporized. The smaller ones we don't see the stickier, but these apparently are sticky enough that they stick to our particles and make it all the way through. They don't just vaporize. Like the smaller ones just vaporize before they get to our target, to our detection region. Okay, okay. So we see these um, radical peaks. Um, so these odd number peaks are radicals. So they're missing an electron um, and, uh, and, and we see them, okay. So um, we see them even when we do pyrolysis. So we see them in the flame. We see them during pyrolysis. Um, you don't see them so clearly when you do gas phase. Look in the gas phase. But we see them very strongly when we do the aerosol mass spec because we basically are concentrating them. So the gas phase is like kind of swamped with these larger peaks of smaller masses. So this is a gas phase with the same system as the one on the left in purple. The one on the right is the gas phase um, mass spectrum that goes along with it. And you see that they're there, but they're little, um, mostly because they're swamped by these other um, peaks. And we just, I think, accumulate them. So we condense, we, we basically see them stronger than you might think. Um, they should be there. Other people have seen them too. So this is a whole list of people who had seen them previously. It's not just us, it's not just our technique. It's basically every time you collect the particles and do mass spec on the composition, you see these peaks. And other people had ignored them. You know, people have talked about, you know, what they could be doing, but you know, for the most part, they kind of were like focusing on, on what are the big masses that could be condensing or nucleating in the flame. Yeah, so here are some other mass spectra um, uh, examples. People have seen them. Um, and here's a paper we wrote where we actually focused on them. Um, and we're like, okay, there's a whole series of them. And if you notice, they start, we think they start with um, propargyl, which is um, C3, so it has a mass of 39. You add uh, an acetylene. And we'll talk about the Hakka mechanism, but you add an acetylene or C, some kind of C2, um, makes 65, you add a C2, makes 91, you add a C2, it makes 115, et cetera, and you go all, all the way up. So we see this whole like selection of these peaks. Okay. Um, and then again, um, the benzyl, this is where we said the 91 peak was funneled by cyclopentyl 
um, kind of came under fire. Um, okay. Uh, and then other people have seen the evidence for, okay, so we see these radicals when we vaporize, but do we know that they're actually part of the particle? Where are they coming from? Other people have done experiments where they've extracted particles and done um, uh, EPR, electron paramagnetic resonance, or electron paramagnetic spin spectroscopy, um, and seen that you have very strong, and, and this is a technique that's really sensitive to radicals, and they see strong signature of radicals for these incipient particles, but as the particles age, that signal goes away. So the mature particles don't show this, this strong radical signal. So it seems like these radicals are associated with these incipient particles. And then we go back to this experiment, right? It, we saw earlier, here are the AFM um, uh, um, uh, images, and here are ones that picked out as being radical species. So even in the AFM, they start to see these radical species. They also see that they're associated with um, five-membered rings, and what they see is also a lot of bridged aromatic groups. Okay, so this is this is just um, like okay. So we're starting to accumulate accumulate evidence, right? Okay. So um, these turn out to be what we call resonance stabilized radicals, or other people call them persistent radicals. And you'll see this in combust the combustion chemistry literature dating back, you know, eons. Um, cyclopentadienyl is a really common. Um, species that people think about the kinetics for, you know, how is it involved? It's a commonly observed um, species or, you know, um, it comes, people spend a lot of time worrying about these types of radicals and what their involvement in, um, in uh, combustion is, in combustion chemistry, okay? So, so we're not the first ones to think about this, but an RSR is, a, so indenyl, so indene when it loses hydrogen becomes indenyl. Um, indenyl is an RSR. So the difference between um, an RSR and a regular, a resonance stabilized radical and a regular radical is it's, um, it's stabilized, so it's not as reactive as, say, an, uh, a non-resonance stabilized radical, so it's, it's not like OH. Um, so it's less reactive than OH, um, and it's uh, more stable than OH, um, but it's less stable than pyrene, than a, what we call closed shell, which has um, completely paired electrons. So a radical has an unpaired electron. Um, so what happens in generating a radical, so here you, you lose a hydrogen atom, right, off of this indenyl. So it ends up that having an electron that used to be sharing, you know, binding with hydrogen, like in a covalent bond, so there are two electrons that are going between the carbon and the hydrogen, and that CH bond on the side of, of, of indene, you pull off that hydrogen, now it has one electron just sitting out in space. And that electron really wants to have company, it's just sitting there alone, it really wants to be with other electrons, it doesn't want to be unpaired. So what happens is, so this is, you remove that hydrogen there, um, and these are um, molecular orbitals, so that those green and uh, red blobs show you electron density, right? So you pull off that hydrogen on the on the indene, and um, and then you have this electron sitting there. It, that electron, instead of it used to be in what we call a sigma bond with the hydrogen in in the plane of the molecule. So now what it does is surrounded by double bonds. Double bonds also have, they have sigma character when they're binding with the um, other carbons. They also have pi. The, the second bond, double bond gives it pi character. So they have electron density like this, and the electrons are sharing. So when you have benzene, the electrons are sharing in the, their, their pi bonds with their pi. They're sharing electron density in the second bond, which is what calls, makes them aromatic, right? Makes them very stable. So in the same way, an RSR takes that lone electron, pops it up into the pi, its p orbital, right? And then it shares its p orbital with all the other p orbitals that are sharing with the double bonds. That's what stabilizes it. Now it's like has delocalized um, electron density. 
now that says, okay, I'm happy. I'm happier than I was, right? But they're still more reactive than a completely closed shell um, molecule. Okay, so, so it looks like now we have five-membered rings are, are common in these um, um, particles. Um, they, have, they seem to have a lot of radicals. Um, um, and these radicals are connected, these resonance stabilized radicals are connected with these um, five-membered rings in some way, okay? And that makes sense because just like indine, losing that electron, the five-membered ring, if it were just a six-membered ring, it probably already would be in a double bond, okay? Okay, so, um, so let's talk about molecular weight growth. So, yeah. Oh, you are awesome. Thank you. What's your name? Dalton. Dalton? Thank you, Dalton. I missed it again. Okay, break, break time. 